Hey guys, welcome back. I hope everyone's doing fantastically, and I hope you uh, you enjoyed the last couple of uh, podcasts that we did. We did some interviews with um, with Vitaly Kissel and also with Eric Holland. Definitely go back and catch those powerful testimony with Vitaly about the the different generations uh, and his family living under the the thumb of oppression and communist uh, Russia, USSR, all of that stuff, and still being um, being Christians who thrive under that oppression. And then we had uh, Eric Holly come in, and we discussed the the Christian roots of the American founding and some of the history there. <clears throat> so a lot of fun, a lot of great information. So hopefully you you enjoyed that. In the next couple of weeks, I think we're going to do something else a little bit different on the um, on the podcast, trying something uh, some a little bit different content to see what uh, what people might think about it. Um, uh, I'll give you a hint: it's a kind of a, like a book review, going through a book and discussing the main points and tying them into the kingdom of God, kingdom principles, because that's what we're about on this podcast. Your life, God's word. We are all about. Uh, applying kingdom principles to our lives, our communities, our families, and all of that. Speaking of our communities and our families, uh, I think you'd probably have to be in a hole somewhere not to realize that we're coming up on Resurrection Sunday, a.k.a. Easter. Uh, Today is Good Friday, and um, this is a time where we really, I mean, people really start to focus, one of the few times throughout the year that we're really all of a sudden focusing on God, on Jesus. Uh, the other one, of course, is Christmas. And then there's some spatterings in between, but the two big ones are, you know, if, if people, sometimes if people don't go to church at all, they don't, get the, they don't connect with the body of Christ like at all, they will go on Christmas, somewhere around there, and, uh, and, and Easter or, or Resurrection Sunday, right? So this is one of those times where we are uh, reaching out to folks, and we are, um, as a church, hopefully cognizant that new people might be coming in here and and possibly hearing the gospel for the first time. So I want to encourage you, I invite your family, your friends, your relatives, take this time uh, to bring them to your assembly, to your local church, uh, try to get them plugged in, try to get them... Um, you know, the message of the gospel, if they've not heard it before, or if they have, maybe in a new context, uh, maybe in a, in a way that the, it's not been presented to them before. Um, there, there's, there, there's a lot of different ways to present the gospel. Some of them are uh, dra- woefully ina- inaccurate. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say inadequate, which is also true, but inaccurate, and, and, and some of them dreadfully um, inaccurate as, well, inadequate as well. I'm getting my, I'm just messing up here. Two things, inaccurate and inadequate. <laughs> there we go. Some of them are accurate, like the facts are accurate from the scriptures, but they're inadequately presented. You know, it's a little, a little too dogmatic, a little too, you know, not so much grace in Jesus. It's more like follow these steps. Um, and then some, some of course, are just completely inaccurate. Uh, there are people who claim to be Christians, don't believe Christ even rise from the, rise, rose from the dead. My, my coffee's kicking in, but my brain hasn't caught up, I think, is what the issue is. Um, we're going to blame it on that. <clears throat> but in, uh, in this episode, I'm, we're, as we go through, we're basically going to show where uh, the gospel is spelled out in Scripture, uh, show where the gospel was lived out in, the, in the, what we call the Gospels, and also where it was first preached out in the book of Acts. But during this time... I want to bring out three, what I'm calling, uh, sort of for, forgotten principles or forgotten lessons uh, about the gospel that many times we overlook or we forget when we're when we're getting caught up in uh, thinking about Jesus and many times thinking about oh you know making it to heaven, being saved, like this kind of stuff. We sometimes forget some of these deeper truths that either are uncomfortable or they, they don't fit into sort of the Western way that people present the gospel. So we'll, we'll dive into all that stuff here over the next little bit together. So let's go ahead and first look at where the, the gospel is first 
spelled out, where the gospel is first spelled out. And that would be 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, when I say spelled out, I mean just a couple of verses that just easily just boop, go right through and tell us what the gospel is. Of course, the word gospel just means good news. And I think some translations of the Bible actually talk when, when that word comes up, it just says good news. Some of the more modern translations. And um, w- what we need to understand is there's specific news about Jesus, there's specific uh, teaching, there's there's something specific about this whole situation that um, that is important and that, that we need to draw people's attention to. And of course, we ourselves need to be firmly rooted in. It has nothing to do with, uh, with a... Um, an Easter bunny or chocolate eggs or candy or baskets <laughs> or putting on that new out that new colorful outfit that really pops with those new shoes that you got right I mean all these things that we you know whoa whoa what is first of all what's resurrection Sunday huh what's that what's Easter about oh Easter yeah I know what that is that's about chocolate and rabbits and an egg hunt and okay um it, I'm, I'm happy to 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 claim to, to wrangle in a, uh, a, a a pagan holiday and use it for the glory of God. Take it, take over it, and you know what? We, we've, we've got this. We're going to make this Resurrection Sunday. This is what we're, we're, when we're going to celebrate that uh, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. However, all of the, uh, all the spring equinox uh, imagery and all that, you know, that stuff, the eggs, the rabbits, the, you know, <laughs> all that stuff— we need to make sure as Christians that I'm not against an egg hunt, okay? But that's not what it's about. We need to put into our children, and we actually need to ourselves realize that's not what it's about. So I'm going to talk about three things that sometimes we forget um, about the the teaching of the gospel. So I digress. Back to First Corinthians chapter 15. So First Corinthians 15:1, <clears throat> Paul says, "Now I would remind you, brothers." of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So a couple of quick things here. I'm not going to dive into the the if statement. That's a big topic, and I think it's something that's that's worth doing a whole podcast on one of these days when we, when we dive into some scriptural teaching and theology and stuff. But uh, understand there is an if statement there. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I, I think this is one of those areas you can go to and see. There are if-then statements in the Bible. Some of them do have to do with even salvation. And I I don't think there's, you know, I don't, I don't think God plays spiritual whack-a-mole with, you know, oh, you messed up, so you know, or it has that eraser for the, you know, the book of life. And you mess up, and he immediately erases you your name, and then and then you're doing a good, and so he writes it back in. Then you then you mess up again. You, I don't I don't think that's really a accurate picture. But I also don't think it's a well. You're in, and now you can you can never ever 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 doesn't matter what you do. Thirty years later, you you know you you go out and commit an atrocious crime and murder and just uh yeah I don't I don't know about that. Um, so again. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So he's saying, your brothers, you believe, but I don't want you to have believed in vain. He says that we are saved, we're being saved by the gospel in verse 2. And this is where we stand. As a church, we shouldn't stand in programs. We shouldn't stand, we should not stand and put our stake and all of our effort and time and energy and everything into our incredible, you know, kids. Uh, you know, kids area and kids club or whatever we have, you know, you know, Sunday school. Um, I'm all for things that, that are, are methods to be able to, you know, bring people in and, and have nice stuff. Hey, have a good youth group, have a good uh, children's ministry, have, you know, this kind of stuff. But things need to point toward a specific thing in which we stand, and that is the gospel. The gospel needs to be preached. Kids need to be going to Sunday school and they need to be learning the gospel. It doesn't mean that you have to teach this set of verses every single Sunday, but kids should have a very solid understanding and awareness of what it is that we as Christians actually believe and what our core, just fundamental teaching 
is. And so this is what Paul breaks down. Verse 3, this is where he starts to break it down. For I deliver to you as of first importance, right? This is chief. This is right there, primary. First importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. So he goes on, talks about more that he he appeared to, but I think we can break it down to a sort of three part um, uh, formula, if you if you would. The gospel is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is what he this is what he broke down to them. Uh, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. So, the first sort of forgotten, sometimes misunderstood, but I'll just say straight up forgotten uh, principle about the gospel is in this first section. Check it out here, because when we get formulaic, when we get form, you know, formula based like that, oh, the gospel is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can detach that from the actual meaning of it, right? Um, what do I mean? What do I mean by that? Well, it's the death, burial, resurrection. It's not just information, though. Okay, it's, this isn't math, right? This is this is r- reality. This is real. This is history. This is spirituality. This is kingdom of God, and it, it's not just oh these three steps. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. I'm not going to go into the accordance with the Scriptures. We could dive into a whole bunch of stuff there. But again, I don't want to make this 17 hours long. So my focus here is going to be He died. Yes, all right, that's part of our formula, right? The three-part death, burial, resurrection, that's what the gospel is. Boom, we're good. On to the next question on the test. Wrong. He died for a reason. For our sins. See, that's the that that's the thing that we forget sometimes. Um, some people talk about the the doctrine of total depravity, uh, but but we are sinners. We are wretched. We we as as human beings in the natural state, we are wicked. We are vile. There's all manner of of despicable things that we are capable of, and we need to. Uh, we need to recognize that. we The gospel, we already said it, it's the good news. But before we get to the good news, there's bad news. That bad news is that we are dead in our sins. We are in sin. We are born into sin. We are sinners because of the sin. This Again, the, I'm, I don't want this to be 17 hours long, so uh, you can certainly... Hit us up with comments or questions if you're not sure where some of this is or you want more uh, more behind this, more scriptural references and things like that. Happy to do a whole video on just the fact that we're sinners. But we are born in sin. This means the wrath of God is upon us. And so Jesus Christ died for our sins. That death was supposed to be our death, right? Romans says that the wages of sin is death, but the... um, Well, actually, let's go read it. The gift of God is eternal life. Let's go read it. Romans 6, 23. This is in the NIV... For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Christ Jesus our Lord. So the the punishment was supposed to be ours. He took it on himself and died for us. So I think that's an important thing for us to remember. There's a bad side to the good news. Um, We... We are we are worthy of that death. We are sinners. We are depraved. We are in disobedience and rebellion to God, and we need rescue. This comes through Jesus Christ. It only comes through Jesus Christ. So, uh, next, uh, he was buried, right? We can go back to our formula. This was true. He was buried, and lots of people die and are buried. 
But the thing that really makes Jesus Jesus, right? <laughs> Even Paul said, if there's no resurrection, I mean, what's the point in everything we're doing? And that he was raised on the third day, again, he says, in accordance with the scriptures. And that is the gospel. But a lot of times what we can do is we can skip through these different points and miss the fact that, yes, he died, and it's because of our sins. We are wretched sinners, and we uh, should not think it's because, you know, a, a, a couple of decades of being in Christ, we can forget sometimes where he brought us from and who who we really are if it were not for Jesus Christ. We can start thinking we're pretty good, you know, I'm pretty good, I'm a pretty good guy. And what happens is, at that point, we start relying on our own righteousness and um, we look at specific sins and, you know, I don't do that, I don't do this, I don't commit this, I'm not that way, I'm not like that person over there, whatever, and we can start getting judgmental and religious. So we have to be very, you know, very cognizant of that, aware of that, and we have to protect ourselves from, you know, kind of divulging down into, divulging, hmm, diverting downward into that kind of thinking. Um, so... Let's go, so that's the gospel spelled out, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. Let's go and see a few um, scriptures here as it regards, to, as it relates to Jesus and what he, um, what he has done, what he has accomplished. Matthew 1, 21. Matthew 1, 21. She shall bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So he will save his people from their sins. John 8, 31 and 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if, here's another if-then statement, right? If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you abide in my word... This goes to many of the statements Jesus made regarding obedience to his word right in John. You can go read John 14, 15 in there. He says several times that if you love me, you know, keep my commands. You will obey me if you love me. This is this is how people will know you're my disciples, right? Through the through that obedience. Uh, one of the marks of a disciple is obedience to Jesus Christ, that Jesus actually is Lord of our lives. Now Again, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free or make you free. And this is, you know, very, very popular scripture. But that's verse 32. Verse 31 said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. There's a comma, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Of course, again, another video we could do. Truth is more than just head knowledge. It's more than just knowing and affirming and having, you know, our mind engaged. Truth is, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So truth is also a person. We And I think it's both. I don't think it's either or, one or the other. If we know Jesus, the person, we have relationship with him. What did he say in, in uh, Matthew 7, right? Depart from me, because what? I never knew you. I think it's important for us to know the truth as a person, to know Christ, to be in relationship with him. And also, what emanates from him is all truth. Every scientific truth emanates from God, right? It emanates from him. Every um, every relational truth, every familial truth, right? There are certain truths that just work in family or work in community. There are certain governmental systems that work better than others. Wherever there is truth, that flows from God. God is truth, right? He is. Everything is going to emanate. So if we learn and we know in relationship with Jesus Christ— we will be people of the truth, and Jesus actually said this. We will be people who listen to truth, and and want and we want truth. We want what is real. We want, right, this is why Christians, there's no conflict between reason and logic and true religion. Why? Because if we know the truth, the person, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, the life, then we, things like logic and reason, we will absolutely cling to, because the rules of logic flow from Jesus Christ. He is truth, <laughs> right? They flow from God. God created this universe, and they, he could have made it a different way. He could have made it an illogical universe, right? He didn't. So scientific truths, uh, everything flows from him. So 
You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Set you free from what? What do, what do we need freedom from? We're in bondage? What, what, what kind of bondage? Well, remember Matthew one twenty one, Save his people from their sins. So the first sort of forgotten truth, forgotten principle is that there's bad news. Okay, there's some there's some bad news before we get to the good news. The second is that Jesus didn't just come to like, you know, get us into heaven. Jesus came to free us from the clutches of sin, to give us power so that we can go on and not be slaves to sin. That is his point. I think this is very, we can overlook this. We can just say that, yeah, that's cool. Let's move on to the next verse. But listen, when people are having a continual struggle with sin, the, it doesn't matter if they check other boxes. Will they pray on a regular basis? Will they fast once, twice, thrice a week? Oh, this person, oh, they speak in tongues. Well, that person does miracles. That person over here is just credible ministry. But if we're constantly in this, like struggle, we don't have this. We don't have a liberty from sin. We don't have um, a mastery over sin. I'm not saying we we never mess up ever. We like we never mess up. The Bible says, First John, if we sin, we have an advocate with with uh, the Father, Jesus Christ. Right? We have, Jesus is our advocate. If we sin, there's an if statement there. If we sin, um, and so we we are supposed to have this this freedom from sin we're not bound by sin so if someone is you know bound by addiction bound by um by envy bound by unforgiveness bound by drunkenness bound by now i'm just trying to name you know sins things that we know are sin um both internal and external we can all oh fornication that's a sin but what about envy or covetousness over here a lot of times we'll we'll be really hard on the you know on the people that you know, are shacking up with their girlfriend or their boyfriend or whatever, but what about the person over here that's clearly covetous? Or what about that person over there that's got a lot of pride and really, you know, that's a rough sin, um, terrible sin. So we, you know, we, I want, we need to understand that we shouldn't be bound by sin. And if we are, the question becomes, did, do we really have a hold of Jesus Christ? Or do we, are, are we just around in the camp with the people that are? Because <laughs> we can, so we can, Put up, you know, put up camp in in a in a good church somewhere, and just kind of go along with that crowd, and people just assume we're all in the same boat, and we're not. You can be in a service with someone, people are lifting their hands, crying, loving Jesus, and and even that person doesn't really necessarily even have the relationship with Jesus that they're supposed to. I don't I don't know. You don't know. A lot of times we can't see uh, someone's heart or whatever. Well, we, I guess we can never see their heart, but we may not even know what's what's going on behind the scenes. Um, but I will say, one of the evidences of a true disciple, of someone who's truly following Christ, is we should have a freedom from sin. We are not bound by sin any longer. And if we are, and if it's this horrible, you know, oh, this, you know, this this struggle with a particular addiction or something like that, I think we need to. We need to get into a place where we are knowing the truth. Because unless the Bible is just wrong, right? This says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus came to save us from our sins, not leave us wallowing in them and just hold, trying to grasp onto him while our sins are also dragging us down. Uh, and, and through the scripture, we see this. There's a, you know, if you sin, uh, so, so there's a there's an element of him delivering us from that sinful state and that sinful nature. Now, First John three seven. So, first, the first kind of lesson, the first truth that many people forget when it comes to the gospel is: before we get to good news, there's some bad news. <laughs> okay. Second, Jesus didn't just come so that we can, you know party in heaven when we're when we're when we're uh when we croak okay oh yeah i can make heaven woohoo i mean yes people that are in the kingdom which we'll get to in just a second um when we die we will continue on in the kingdom which is heaven right but we're not going to make heaven if we're not in the kingdom now in the earth and 
So he, he came not just for that. He came to actually save us from that sin nature. He came to save us from those sins that bind us and, and tear us away from him and take us down paths that we really ultimately don't want to be going down that path. There's some fun maybe on the way. Woo, I can see some areas where that's going to be fun, but the price at the end is not going to be fun. 1 John 3, 7 and 8. Little children, let no one deceive you, right? Because we can be deceived about this. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now, the context of destroying the works of the devil is in the context here of sinning. The devil wants to get us in sin. He wants to get us to be in sin. He wants to get us to continue to sin. He wants to entice us uh, from the very beginning. Satan's plan was, you know, was not to try and leap on Adam and Eve and like, you know, possess them or his whole thing was what? Get them to disobey God, which is sin. I think sin can be boiled down to a very simple understanding, a very simple definition, disobedience to God. You and I, if we disobey God, we are sinning, period. He says, do it, and we don't, we've sinned. He says, don't do it, and we do, we've sinned. So I think we will always have um, a struggle, just like uh, Paul said in Romans 7. Um but then in Romans 8, he gives the answer. What is it? Walking in the Spirit, and we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's the, you know, that's the whole thing. In uh, Galatians 5, same thing, right? Spirit versus flesh. We need to be in the Spirit. We need to be in that relationship with God, walking according to His principles, and let His Spirit guide us. This is the answer to maintaining our freedom. So, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. What did he come to do? To make his people free from sin, to save his people from sin. So the work of the devil is to get us to be engulfed in, enveloped in, wrapped up and entangled within our sin. So he enticed Eve, and he, you know, what are you going to entice Eve with? I mean, she's living in paradise. Ah, ah, but he found something. Well, there's this tree that you're not allowed to eat of, and you know God, He's holding He's holding out on you. There's some good stuff, and you can be as gods. And what does that mean? You're in charge. I'm in charge. You shall be as gods. This is the the most fundamental, most basic um, sin that there is. You shall be as God. The the, the most basic enticement that there is. Uh, in, in modern society, we can see, you know, neo-Marxism and cultural Marxism. And, and really, this is a direct line to that original temptation. Ye shall be as gods, right? You make your way. You determine, right? You are the one who, you know, is in charge of and in control of, um, you know, every, just everything. Just your full mastery in, of, of your destiny and and even your biology and everything. Just you, 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 you. Me, 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 me. That's what the devil wants us to get entangled in. That's the work of the devil. You know, I'm sure he's, I'm, I'm sure he very much enjoys it when people recognize who and what he is and they serve him directly. I mean, they know what they're serving. They know what they're doing. But those people are going to be very few and far between. Satan is a pragmatic being. He knows that, I mean, very, very few people are going to be like, yes, yeah, Satan is a being. He is this evil, wicked, fallen angel, and I'm going to serve him, and I'm going to do what he wants, and I'm on his team. Um, that's why the Church of Satan actually says they don't even believe in an entity called Satan. Now, whether that's true, I mean, they're Satanists. Can, can you really trust anything they say? But what do they say? They say really what they're about is exalting man, making man the, the you know the chief um, one that's in control, in charge, making man the master. 
Uh, you know, this this uh, video that recently came out, little Nas X, and you know he's got this video and these like shoes that came out called Satan shoes, supposed to have like a drop of blood in them, and all this nonsense. Of course, you know a lot of it. They they do this stuff for publicity, like shock and awe value type of thing. Um, but they, they lots of times they don't know what they're messing with, and uh, you know I, I poor little Nas X, um, you know messing with some serious stuff. But in his video. Apparently, he uh, gets Satan a lap dance in the middle of the video or whatever. Like, it's just disgusting, debauched stuff. But this is where Satan wants us. Little Nas X thinks he's doing it. He's in control. He, He's God. And in the video, he actually, I guess toward the end, like, like snaps Satan's neck or whatever and grabs the crown and, and puts it on himself and sits on on Satan's throne and uh, one of the top dogs or maybe like the chief guy of the uh, Church of Satan came out and said this this guy little Nas X apparently did his research because that's what we're about that's what the Church of Satan is really about not not the there's some some spooky you know fallen angel guy but that we are in control so he said that was the most satanic part of the of the whole video was that. There is no. I, I I got rid of Satan. I'm sitting in the in the throne. I've got the crown on. I do what I want to do. Right. Uh, that famous line. Um, do as thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. Right. That's kind of that's their philosophy, and so Satan is happy to get back into the shadows and work from the darkness, and <clears throat> get us to live in disobedience and continued rebellion against God. And that's what Jesus came to undo, the works of the devil, which is what? To keep us in disobedience, in rebellion, in um, in our sin, chained in sin. Now, we're having a good time. We think, oh, you know, woo, I'm making money. I'm, you know, getting high. I'm, <laughs> you, know, you know, having all these relationships and all. I'm enjoying. Uh, no. When we when we find that that money is incredibly empty and, and we always, and, and, and it's, it's just, there, there's no solace and comfort in it. Ultimately, when we're uh, strung out and addicted and wrecked our body because of the lifestyle we've lived, or we're, you know, all these, all these uh, broken relationships and we're just, our, our psyche and emotions are just torn and destroyed. Uh, we'll realize that price was way too high. And then if we don't repent, oh my, the price is going to be very high in eternity. So this is Jesus came to undo that, to wake us up and help us to realize we need him. We need to overcome. We need to be saved from our sin. So now we're going to get into a couple of scriptures here that is, uh, they are going to speak to the last uh, point, the last truth that many have forgotten about the gospel. Matthew 16. 15 through 19. He said to them, who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then we go over to John 3, 1 through 6, is the is the some of the context here, but basically Nicodemus comes to God, um, or comes to God, <laughs> well, he is God, but Nicodemus doesn't know that, comes to Jesus, uh, verse 3, we're picking up here, John 3, 3, now there was a man, I'm sorry, John 3, 1, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night, said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now look at Jesus' answer. He skips straight to the chase. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I mean, he just goes straight to kingdom, kingdom of God, need to be born into it. Of course, Nicodemus in verse 4 says to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit... He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So the third principle is that Jesus was not just about just coming and just 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 saving a bunch of people, just helping a bunch of people. 
He was about, no, 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 I'm coming and I'm bringing something with me. I'm coming and I'm infiltrating the kingdom of darkness, and I am actually setting up a, another, an opposing kingdom here, not, not just one day off in eternity somewhere. There's going to be heaven, and we all get to you know, grab a harp, float around on a cloud, talk to, you know, talk to angels and, and the apostles and Old Testament prophets and you know, whatever. That, that's not the point. The point is God's kingdom in the earth. Well, what was what was Eden? That's God's kingdom in the earth, right? What what was the the what was the the whole children of Israel and my, my chosen people and this nation that stands out amongst all the nations? That's God's kingdom in the earth. God has always viewed this thing in a grander, more cosmic um, sort of setting, and that is His kingdom. Above all else, you go to Daniel, you see that this is the, you know, the, much of the theme, the kingdom of, of God. It's kingdom versus kingdom. It's Satan's kingdom or Satan slash man's kingdom versus God's. And so Jesus came to usher in this, this new, this kingdom in the earth. And we are able to enter the kingdom by being born again. A lot of people say that word, born again. Are you born again? You're a born again believer, born again Christian. But that is true, and the way to get into the kingdom is to be born again, of water and of spirit, as Jesus said. So, forgotten truth number one, there's bad news before we get to the good news. Number two, Jesus came, not just so we can go to heaven, Jesus came to deliver us and save us from sin. We can be freed from sin in this life. And... Jesus came and brought something with him. He brought the kingdom of God in which, into which we are born when we're born again. He was kingdom-focused. He was kingdom-focused. And this is what I said earlier. When we're in the kingdom and we die or when Christ returns, however that, you know, whatever that looks like, uh, based on your eschatological viewpoint and background and everything, we can get into that sometime. But... We are already in the kingdom when we're born into it. We are one of those um, following Christ, Jesus is Lord, and then we die. Well, we continue on in the kingdom. Well, what's that continu- continuation look like? Well, now we're in you know, heaven or the new, the new heavens, the new earth, and all this stuff. But it's a continuation. When, when, when we're already in the kingdom and he returns, guess what? We continue on in the kingdom. Only now, instead of in the earth with this battle and struggle, nope, he's come he 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 wins the final victory and now we continue on with him so that's uh that's sort of the gospel spelled out if you would and now we're going to move to where the gospel is actually lived out where this actually happens of course Matthew Mark Luke and John all record this the death burial resurrection of Jesus Christ um in Matthew it's uh chapter 27 verse 32 somewhere in there to about Chapter 28, verse 15, the death, the burial, the resurrection. And then it picks up and continues with Matthew 28, 16 through 20. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. That's always going to be the case. Come on. All right, the closing of the book of Acts, right? Some believed, some didn't. Always going to be the case. Verse 18, Jesus came said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Same thing, Mark 15, 21 through about 16, 12. We have the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then afterward, He's talking with his disciples once again. What does he say? Afterward, he appeared to the, to the eleven. This is uh, Mark sixteen fourteen, as they were reclining at at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. So again, all right, some of them not believing because they had not believed those who saw him after he'd risen. He said to them, "Go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe." 
in my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven <clears throat> and set down at the right hand of God. They went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Luke 23, uh, 26 through chapter 24, verse about 12. Again, we have the death, the burial, the resurrection. We've got all that recorded, the crucifixion, the tomb. All of this is there. Uh, and then we have verse 44, Luke 24, 44 through 53. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So remember we talked earlier about according to the scriptures. This is what he's saying. Verse 45, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. They worshiped him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple blessing God. So uh, then, of course, John 19, 17 through about John 20, verse 10 or so. Again, the death of the resurrection. John's account afterwards, a little bit different. This is, again, just another viewpoint and take on it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, of course, are the um, are the three kind of parallel synoptic gospels. Um, and so <clears throat> what do we have here? Some very, uh, some very common themes. We have repentance. Repentance is preached. Repentance is something the, the, um, the, the early church was to do. Baptism, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, right? We just read in Luke that there, you're going to receive power, um, and you need to go wait in Jerusalem. This is where it's going to first happen. We have um, evangelism. Go into all the world. Go and preach this to everybody. Go, go. I mean, just bring them in. Just bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in. And we have discipleship, right? Teaching them to obey. Teaching these people. It's not just bring them in, and then we all just sit here and just, you know, just hold on until Jesus comes. And um, it's no, there's a continual teaching and growth and development and lots of living to do um, once we come into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the gospel sort of lived out. That's where it happened. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We have the, the crucifixion, the going to Golgotha. We have him getting, you know, the 39 stripes on his back. We have him uh, dying. We have the, the, the burial in the tomb. We have the three days and the resurrection. This is recorded in every single one of the Gospels. This is what we're going to be talking about over this weekend, right? Good Friday is when he, you know, we, we, we focus on the death and then Resurrection Sunday, that is when we celebrate the fact that, guess what? Everybody dies, people get buried, that's how it happens. But Jesus rose from the dead in all power, according to Matthew 28. He's got all power. He's got all power. He, you know, he, it, it, It's Adam failed, but Jesus prevailed, right? That That's kind of where, that ain't even rhymed, man. <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry. Sometimes I just, you know, amuse myself. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the whole, I mean, this whole cosmic thing is going on. It's not just like this one, oh yeah, Jesus, you know, did some good stuff so that I can be healthy, wealthy, and then, you know, die and, and, and go to heaven. Um, he, it, it's a much bigger picture than that, much bigger picture than that. So the last thing I want to do is talk about the first time the gospel was preached out. So we've already gone through where it's spelled out in 1 Corinthians 15, where it's lived out in the various um, components and, and, and sort of lost or forgotten truths, as well as all of the Gospels, where it actually happened and what happened afterward, how he told them, go and wait um, for the promise of the Father. Go and you know go to Jerusalem. It's going to kickstart from there. And you guys are going to preach this all over the world. and you know, um, So now we have where it's preached out for the first time. Now let me set the stage. Acts chapter 2, we have the ascension. We have all that going on. He says, go, you're going to receive power after the Holy Spirit comes on you, which links up with 
Luke chapter 24, um, and also, you know, Mark 16. Um, and then we have uh, the beginning of the book of Acts, right? Uh, chapter 2, right through there, verses 1 through about 13 or so. And we have the infilling of the Spirit. We've got the, remember John 3? born again of water and spirit and he talks about how he talks about wind and how you know where the you know you don't you can't tell when it comes where it's coming from where it's going but this is what it's going to be like when people are born of the of the spirit and then what are they doing they're there they're praying they're obeying god doing what he said to do and all of a sudden they hear wind and they see fire and it's like they've had these images in their mind of fire and wind throughout jesus's teaching so this is sort of a confirmation for them. Okay, we've been here praying. What are we waiting for? When's it going to happen? This is it. <laughs> this is the thing that he has been talking about. Here's some confirmation with these miraculous signs. They start speaking in tongues. This is powerful. It spills out onto the street. <coughs> people think, oh my goodness, this is crazy. These people are nuts, though. Bible actually says, you know, they thought they were drunk. Um which again, see, this is this is uh, just a side note here, just a real quick side note. I am big on the Bible to do things decently in order and all this stuff, but what I mean, if it's just a bunch of people sitting at a table having a theological discussion, who is going to think they're drunk? People might think you're crazy uh, because you know maybe it's they just think it's boring or whatever. Be, you know, I can sit at a table and talk, you know, theology for hours, but everybody can't do that. They might think I'm nuts. But why would people think they were drunk? I want you to think about that. Think about that. Why would people think they were drunk? Um, you know, because if it's just they were speaking languages, well, the people understood the languages. So, I mean, if I walk up on somebody that's talking and they're just talking my language, I'm not going to think, oh, they're clearly drunk. What, what was going on? What was going on there? There was more there than just like, you know, this, this uh, you know, some churches are just like, I mean, if you raise your hand to like worship God, it's like, oh my goodness, whoa, what are you doing? You're out of order. And I, I just don't, mm, I don't, I don't know that, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we need to be, you know, throwing people on the ground and jerking them around and stuff. <laughs> ah! But, but I think there's a, ha I think there's a medium in, in, in there. I think there's a, there's a balanced middle. Anyway, not even, not even my point. That was just kind of a tangent. Um, but here we're going to pick up in Acts chapter two, verse 14, but Peter standing with the 11. So he's in unity with, with the rest of the disciples, right? All of them. Matthew was there, right? John was there. They're all there. Right? There's no, well, the P Matthew versus Peter or, you know, this, this kind of stuff that people try to do. It just doesn't work because this is actually the second time that we know they were all right there. And, you, and actually, this is the first time. Later on, he says, um, the, uh, Luke writes that the, um, the people ask Peter and the rest of the apostles, what should we do? So they, all the apostles, they were all there. So Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted his voice. He addressed the men of Judea, all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered by the prophet Joel. Verse 17, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream, your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show, now, again, who's prophesying? Just the apostles? Just special? No, that's not what this says. People are, uh, tons of people, servants, handmaids, people, young men, old men, dreaming dreams, seeing visions. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood, fire, vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day, right? This is the biblical imagery stuff that we see, right? Um, sun turning to darkness, moon to blood. This is imagery that the Bible uses, right? Because he's saying this was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Did, did the universe melt away? No, but it's biblical imagery showing a cataclysmic event, and an event in this, obviously here in the spirit, that was really was cosmic changing, right? <laughs> I mean, anyway, uh, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the 
definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Whoa. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So again, a couple of times he's linking this back to the Old Testament Scripture, showing this is scriptural, this is fulfillment. Verse 29, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses." being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, said to my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God hath made, uh, God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So a couple of times he points out their sin here. He points out, you crucified the Messiah. You are the ones who did it. You took him. You were wicked. You did this. It's on you. You crucified the the, the Christ, the, the the Lord God, right? He's, these guys are like, whoa. The Bible actually goes on to say, verse 37, right? They were, they were pricked in their heart. They, they were, they were, oh, they're so convicted. And they said, men and brothers, what shall we do? They said this to Peter and the rest of the apostles. What shall we do? Peter, of course, says you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the, for the remission or the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that is the water and spirit from John 3. That's the Luke 24, right? Repentance and remission of sins. I mean, this fits with all of the things we just read. And... That is, I mean, he preached the gospel to them. That's what he preached. Let's look at it again. What's the gospel? First, we've got the first, we've got the the, the bad news. The bad news is you guys are sinners. <laughs> you think you're righteous. You think you're, but you are sinners. You killed the you killed the Christ. You murdered him. His blood is on you. Um, you need a savior, right? You need. You are you are in trouble. You need a savior. And then he then he preached Jesus, Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, and resurrected. That's the preaching of the gospel. That's the preaching of the gospel. And I think that's what we need to understand. This uh, this weekend, or over the next couple of weeks, if you're thinking about it, or coworkers come to you, or family members, preach the gospel to them. Yes, part of the gospel is a little bit confrontational, right? You are a sinner. Not coming from the lips of someone who's never sinned or not a sinner, and I'm not, you know, I, I have no idea, I can't relate, but someone that, no, Jesus saved me, don't you understand? Jesus um, was there for me. Jesus helped me and saved me from my sin, and he can do the same for you, but that's part of it is the recognition, I am a sinner. I need Jesus. I am in my sins. I am lost without him. I deserve God's wrath, God's judgment, um, and yet Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, so I can have an escape, I can have a way out. That's the gospel. Now, in this particular situation, they responded favorably. What do we need to do? And when that question was posed, like put out there, so I think a lot of times we, we want to jump ahead, not let the gospel do its work, not trust God to do his part, not, you know, we just want to just jump on in and, and, and start telling people what they need to do here in this situation, in that situation, follow these steps, that kind of stuff. And we didn't even really preach the gospel to them, or we did, and their reaction is like folks in other places in the book of Acts where we see the same message was preached, like you killed the Messiah, and the reaction was more like, no, we're going to pick up stones and kill you. <laughs> so... 
You know, we need to let God do that work. Preach the gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection. Good Friday, death, right? Friday to Saturday, burial. But Sunday, he was resurrected. What does this even have to do with me? What is that? I'm, you know, some single mom trying to just make it through. What does it have to do with anything? Don't you understand Jesus wants to rescue you from your sins? The things in your life, your, your, the disappointments, the problems, the issues, those come from sin, and God wants to rescue you from that. You know, some guy out there just, you know, trying to trying to find his way in life, and maybe he's got a couple of, a, you know, secret addictions to things that people don't know about. He's struggling and just trying to do his best. And guess what? Jesus wants to extend that hand of mercy. He resurrected uh, so that, I mean, he has all power, and so that he can reach to that person and bring them up to where he is, bring them into the kingdom, born again. Now, that message may resonate with some, and it may not resonate with others. And when that message is preached this Sunday or over the weekend or across, you know, however it works over the next few weeks, as people are thinking about it a little bit more, hopefully, right, we need to look for those people that their response is, what do I need to do? This sounds good. I want this. Like I'm, I'm done with the drugs. I'm done with the, the I'm, you know, strung out on or or addicted to pornography or I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a horrible family situation because of choices I've made because of sin. Okay, you know, it's it's sin that causes pain and and, and problems in the earth. There would be no pain or problems or issues at all if it wasn't for sin. And so, people recognize it and see the need and. They want the Savior. They want the solution. Then our message can be, you need to repent. Make Jesus Lord of your life. Repent. Turn from your sins. Be baptized. Be filled with the Spirit. He is there to do what? To empower us to be free from our sin, to walk in relationship with the God who created all things, to walk with Jesus Christ, our Lord, this is the message of the gospel, and I hope that we have not forgotten it. I hope that we, this weekend, will be a voice crying in the wilderness, a wilderness of sin, a cesspool of materialism. We live in Western culture, and it is an absolute cesspool. Sin, idolatry, wickedness, debauchery, a little Nash shaking his tush you know, <laughs> on Satan's lap. Really? Come on. This is where our culture has gone. But it's been there for a long time. Just because it's now reached a point where, I mean, it's that. What's the answer? Death, burial, resurrection. Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's preach it. Let's teach it. Let's throw it out there for people to have and see what the reaction is. Some will say, ah, that's a bunch of junk, or I've heard it a thousand times, ah, whatever. Or maybe at one time I was even in that thing, but I've rejected it now, and I'm, I've, I'm over here clinging to other things. But there will be people who say, tell me more. There will be people who say, what do I need to do? There will be people who say, I'm I'm so hurting and I'm so done with the way I've, I've tried the materialism. I've tasted from the bitter fruit of, uh, of, of selfishness and pride and envy and, and, and fulfilling my lusts and desires. I've tasted of it and I don't want it anymore. For those people, we need to be ready to be the church, to preach the good news, to bring them in, to disciple them and to see them set free and made a new creature in the kingdom of God. I love you guys. I hope this has helped. I hope this has encouraged you to walk in and stand in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Have an awesome Good Friday, a wonderful Resurrection Day weekend. And we will catch you on the next podcast. Hey, guys, hope you enjoyed that content from Bread Breakers. If you enjoyed the content, give us that thumbs up. And if you have any suggestions on future content or anything like that, don't forget to leave us a comment in the comment section. Also, subscribe and hit that notification bell. That way, every time we put out something new, a new video, a new interview, whatever it might be, you will be notified. We will throw some additional videos and playlists up here on the screen. And as always, God bless you. We'll catch you on the next video.